You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Wednesday show talking with K-State and Washburn law professor Roger McOwen on his recent blog article. Roger, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Shelby. Roger, talking about a few points in this blog article, and the first one, discussing sweat equity and why maybe that's not how we should do things. Well, indeed, I think that there's a lot of peril in in doing things informally, and and a lot of farming arrangements happen to be informal, and sweat equity is one of those. And if we rely on sweat equity, or just basically what I mean by that is, I'm putting in time in this operation, I'm putting in my blood, sweat, and tears, I should have some equity out of this in the back end. That's what sweat equity means. And if we rely upon that as a transition plan without actually getting anything down in writing, then the next generation can be disappointed because they'll build up uh, the business by investing money, investing time with the belief that they'll eventually own it and control it in the future. Well, what I've seen so many times is that's fine and all goes well until it doesn't, and then we've got a problem. And so you end up in a situation where the next generation might believe that their reward for all of that sweat equity is uh, based on their trust and their commitment and the eventual ownership and control of the family farming operation. But um, the current generation may not necessarily follow through with that, and that can become a major problem down the road. What are a few good ways to avoid that being a major problem? Well, to minimize that risk, of course, I think the best way would be to formalize and document your relationships uh, within the family and what the expectations are, and then write out a solid plan for the future. Where are we going with this operation? The current generation needs to think that through. What do they want the business to look like after they're gone? And the subsequent generation needs to think through what they want things to look like when the current generation of owners and controlling parties are are gone. So both sides to the equation, both generations need to think this through. And a part of that, the big part of that, is maintaining clear and open communication and, and dealing in actual dollars. That's important. In sweat equity, you cannot invest it. You cannot save it. And so the parties need to be dealing with actual dollars, actual money on the line, backed up with written agreements between the parties. And when we're talking about writing agreements and thinking about that next generation, important to also keep in mind those siblings so everything's clear and communicated? That's right, because the the last thing the next generation wants is to have invested substantial time and money in the, in the family farming operation to end up never getting ownership and control. And so you've got to talk with your siblings Uh, You've got to talk with all of the family members because the family farming operations are a business, and we have to look at them as a business. Yes, it's it's a family that's involved, and I think that even points out in in, uh, more situations than not that it's more important to reduce these understandings to writing so that we can avoid conflict within that family unit, Um, and, and that's important for keeping these family operations intact from generation to generation. So, again, I come back to where we started from. Don't rely on sweat equity in an informal transition plan. Really give it some thought. It's worth spending some time and spending some money with professionals to help you put a plan together. And speaking of keeping farms together and making sure everything's going as well as it can be, another point in your article is negligent entrustment and a case out of Texas that involves this. Yeah, what what I'm talking about there is dealing with your liability exposure. If you have an employee, a farm employee that works on your farm for you, what steps should you take to minimize your potential legal problems? And we often have employees that are entrusted with using machinery and equipment and all all types of tools. Well, the question can be, what if the use of those by a farm employee or a family member of a farm employee uh, results in some type of liability exposure, an injury, some type of accident, those types of things. And again, we come back to formalizing um, agreements, and I'll get to that in a moment. But you're right, there was a recent case, and this is out of Texas, uh, it was a 2023 case, and we had a young man that was killed while riding an ATV driven by the teenage son of the farming operations employee. So the individual that was killed was not an employee. He wasn't riding with an employee. He was riding with the son of an employee on that on that farming operations ATV. Well, the accident occurred off the farm's premises during a fishing excursion that these two teenage boys went on, 
And the farm owner got sued for wrongful death based on negligent entrustment. Uh, the ATV was used by the employee on the farm. It was a farm ATV. And so what the, uh, the plaintiff was doing, the plaintiff's attorneys was doing in this wrongful death case was trying to connect all the dots and to tie it back to the farming operation, even though it wasn't used by the farm employee on the premises at the time of, of the accident. And so what did happen? How did that case play out? Well, both the trial court and the appellate court determined that there was no negligent entrustment because there wasn't what the law calls a special relationship between the ATV driver and the farm. He wasn't an employee, as I said. The accident did not occur on the farm premises. It was being used at the time of the accident for personal purposes rather than business purposes. And so there really wasn't a tie back to the farming operation or the owner of the farming operation And the courts also pointed out that the farm owner didn't know or have any reason to know that the employee's son was an unlicensed driver or didn't know how to handle an ATV. So there was no negligent entrustment in this situation. And Roger, you mentioned formalizing agreements around this topic. So what might farmers and producers want to be doing? Well, I think it's important, even with smaller operations, to have at least a basic written guide for usage of these types of items in an employee handbook. And I think um, it doesn't have to be a uh, a full-blown employee handbook like you'd see at a major corporation, but if we reduce certain understandings to writing in what we would call an employee handbook in the farm setting, I think that's a good idea. And also carefully train employees on the usage of farm equipment, machinery, and vehicles, and make it clear that when you take them off the farm premises and they're used by someone other than a farm uh, employee, then you're not going to be responsible for any bad things that occur as the farm farmer or the farm owner. And also make sure, I I would add this, make sure your liability insurance is adequate uh, by getting a thorough review of what the policy does and does not cover. And I think you take all of those steps, and together they can help minimize your liability exposure. And Roger, just one more topic for us to talk about today from this blog article involving current deduction versus capitalization. And what is the difference between that? Yeah, there's always a a line that has to be drawn between things that you can currently deduct associated with your business. And by things, I mean expenses associated with your business and other expenses that have to be capitalized, meaning added to the basis uh, in your land, for example, and recovered over a period of time. And it's always a, an interesting way the IRS draws that line. And, and about a dozen years ago, they gave us some regulations to try to clarify this and also some safe harbors that farmers can use. But um, the basic issue here is when we try to distinguish between deductible ordinary and necessary expenses paid or incurred during the tax year in carrying on the farming business and amounts that are spent to restore property, that's where the line is, is drawn. Amounts paid for incidental repairs are currently deductible. But if I am buying a new item, new property, or I'm making a permanent improvement or a betterment that increases the value of any property that I use in my business, as well as amounts that I spend to restore my property uh, back to a workable condition, those costs have to be capitalized and added to my basis in that item or in that land. Uh, so that, that that's the major point that farmers need to be aware of. Uh, if I've got materials and supplies, those are going to be fully deductible if I'm going to use them in my farming business over the next 12 months. And that includes tractor tires. We always just write off tractor tires. Now, not n- not tires on a new tractor, but replacement tires. Just write them off. And there's a safe harbor rule that can be used, but any amount beyond the safe harbor that is paid to improve existing property, we're going to capitalize that. So the rules are actually, Shelby, they're pretty detailed, they're pretty tricky. Um, You know, if I'm overhauling a tractor engine or I'm replacing disc blades or I'm working on my pivot irrigation equipment, we need to make sure that we know the tax rules that apply before we do those things so that we're going to get the best tax result. So in those scenarios, check with your tax professional? Exactly. Uh, The good tax professional here can save you a lot of money uh, and really help your bottom line. Roger, if people want to read more on this blog article or other articles from you, how can they do that? They can find it uh, on my website, uh, washburnlaw.edu backslash Walter, W-A-L-T-R, as well as on Ag Manager. Roger, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some information from your recent blog article. 
Well, thank you very much, Shelby. That was K-State and Washburn Law Professor Roger McOwen. If you'd like to read more on these points, you can do so by checking out his recent blog article titled More Legal and Planning Issues to Ponder. You can find it by following the link in today's show notes on actday.net or by going to washburnlaw.edu backslash W-A-L-T-R or you can also find it by going to agmanager.info, selecting contributors, and choosing Roger McOwen. If you'd like to read other blog articles that Roger has completed around agricultural law and taxation, you can also find those on washburnlaw.edu and agmanager.info.